Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, raise your hand if you went to the observatory last night. Nice. Okay, I have a couple. Um, go ahead and turn on your clickers, please. And I just have a survey question. You'll, everybody will get correct answers for this one, whether you answer yes or no. Just click in whether A. And you have to hit the send key. Hit Type A or B and then hit the send key. Right, good. I showed that to Courtney the other day and she, she was pretty happy about it. Which, if you, if you didn't go, that's, that's, that's all right, don't worry about it. Just, I just wanna see how many actually did go. Okay, 10 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Do you have a question back there? What? What's his problem? Not on the right frequency. Do you know how to turn? Is this your first time using it? All right, try it again. All right, go ahead and click. Uh, finish, yeah, go ahead. All right, uh, good. It looks like uh, about 36 of you went. And I want to go over a couple details with you concerning the... Uh, Observatory visit, can you bring the volume down a little bit? Um, that's better. All right, uh, I, I looked back to the historical archives and I uh, found that some semesters I gave five points, some I gave 10. So we'll go with 10 points per visit. Uh, however, the handout has to be handed in at the observatory, right? That's how we know that you were there instead of just handing me some handout that, you know, that you may, I'm not looking at anybody, but if you, you know, if you just hand me a handout here in class, oh yeah, Dr. B, it was great. Because I know that things were happening last night and students, yeah, I heard you laughing back there. Uh, Anyways, it has to be handed in at the observatory, All right? And as many times as, as the weather permits and as you can squeeze it into the schedule, you'll go. So potentially you might have 10, 20, even 30, you know, depending on how many sessions actually run. And I was very happy to hear it. I understand you guys uh, saw the Andromeda Galaxy last night. Is it, is that, uh, and you observed Albireo, the double star. Did you see the different colors for Albireo? Supposedly, if you have a good telescope, you can see the, the, the colors. You know, one of them's bluish, one of them's a little bit reddish yellow. So, um, and then uh, Saturn, you saw the rings of Saturn, I'm sure. We're gonna talk about Saturn in detail today for that reason. Uh, but anyways, as many times as you can, go ahead and do that. Um, any questions about observatory sessions? Yeah, go ahead. What's that? I know, I heard it was a lot of bugs over there last night. Yeah, it's just, I, I don't know what to tell you. It's, it's Florida. And it's, it's supposed to start cooling off at night, but so far. But I'm just glad you guys got a chance. Bugs aside, uh, I'm glad you guys got a chance to go out there and see it. Sounds good. Any other uh, questions or comments?
Anybody stay past the normal time? How did anybody stay late? And because you know those guys, the guys that are running it, I'm sure they stayed there till two or three in the morning. I mean, they might still be over there putting stuff away right now as we speak, but because uh, they they go they pull all nighters out there because the weather is so poor here that it's it's hard to get a good night. Okay, another thing I want to mention before we get down to business with Jupiter is uh, clicking data. I just made a full roundup of clicking data um, and posted it in grades. So you have two new lines. One of them is, well, you can see down here at the bottom, clicking answers as of 10, 10, 17. And then the other one is clicking correct uh, as of 10, 10, 17. Now, everybody has a number somewhere between 0 and 15. Uh, and uh, that is where your participation points come from. They come from the answers, the very top one, all right? And in this example, I made them both 11, but you might have an 11 and a 9, or a 15 and a 13, you know, or 15 and 15, that means you answered all of them and you got them all correct. So I keep track of both of those. Now your participation pointage for your grade, we convert into 45 points. Now it's kind of early to do it, but we're going to do it today. We're going to do an example together. And there's also one in discussions in web courses. And between those two examples, you ought to have a handle on how that works. Uh, uh, but by the end of the semester, you know, we'll have a ton more questions. And it'll be, instead of over here where it says 11 out of 15, it'll say, you know, 87 out of 105 or something like that, because we'll have a lot more questions. So this will change uh, from time to time. And I expect to do one or two more roundups, two or three more roundups between now and December. So uh, then the correct figure, the second figure, clicking correct as of 10, 10, 17, uh, the way that that works is if you get a 75% and 11 out of 15, uh, I believe that's, can somebody click that through on your calculator? I think it's like 82 or 86%, something like that. 11 out of 15 or 73. Okay, 73%, 11 out of 15. So That's right, 73.333%. Uh, so this one's not going to get the bonus. The bonus goes... Four bonus points if you get 75% or more. So basically, every time you click an answer, don't just type in IDK, IDK, because that's never going to be correct. All right. Um, if you want to get the bonus, basically it means uh, four bonus points, 75% correct. That's like getting a B on the clicking questions in class, 75%. All right. So if you do that. Uh, faithfully, and if you're a little bit below 75% now, just bear down and start clicking good, think and talk to your your uh, your your neighbor, consult and and talk things over as we go through the questions, and hopefully you'll get your uh, percentage up. Now I want to work on a percentage uh, or a participation point as an example, so let's take these numbers that we've got here. Uh, 11 out of 15. Now go ahead and circle um, 11 out of 15. All right now, this is going to be our example. So this is John Q. student. All right, and he answered 11 questions. He got all of them right. That's the second row. But the clicking answers is what we're going to focus on here. So his percentage, 11 out of 15, right, 73%, 73.33. Go ahead and write that down. Because And I'm going to ask you a clicker question here in a minute. You're going to do another um, calculation just like this. So jot this down in your notes and uh, so that you can do it again. You know, I might give you, you know, 33 out of 45 or something like that. And you're going to calculate out uh, what that has to be. So you start with the basic performance. This is your participation percentage. Um, and what I'm looking for here is 85. Now, if you have a number of, of 85% or more, ding, 
45 points, just, you know, straight, all right? If you're below 85%, then you got to do this uh, calculation. This is the tricky part. So most of you won't be in this. Uh, so if you're doing your, your uh, you're trying to estimate your grades and you're, you know, you, you come in at 85% or more, just write yourself down 45 out of 45. But if you're less than that, like this guy, um, you have to make a special calculation. And it's not that bodacious, but it's a little unusual. Because we're based on our criteria, performance criterion of uh, 85%. So that's your percentage. All right, 73.33%. Now, what you do is you form this proportion. You put your percentage in the numerator and then 85% in the denominator. That's your, perform that's your figure of merit, your performance criterion. If you make that, you get all the points. You're at 100%. You'll get all 40. I mean, do this calculation. Put 85 in the, in the numerator, and your points will work out to 45. It's only if you're below 85% that you have to do this proportion. All right, so there's your proportion, 73.33%. On top, 85% on the bottom. And then on the other side, the numerator is going to be your participation pointage for the semester grade. You know, somewhere between 0 and 45. And most of you guys that click faithfully in class, you'll have 45. Maybe a few will have 44. A very small fraction will have anything less than 44. Anyways, and then the total pointage for the semester... Uh, possible is 45. So there's your proportion. Now, if you cross multiply 45 over to the left, you'll get this second expression. All right. 45 times the quotient 0 0.733 divided by 0 0.85. All right. So basically, I've, I've cross multiplied 45 from the right side up to the left side. And it's, it's de facto in the numerator there, all right? And that is the number that's going to equal your uh, participation pointage, all right? Now, let me go down to the next line. There's the same, same uh, equation there. Now, all you have to do is calculate the quotient, 0 0.733 divided by 0 0.85, and then multiply that by 45. So here's what that works out to. 45 times that quotient, and this is the one that I was thinking of, 86.27%, 0 0.8627, and you go ahead and jot that down, and then multiply that by 45, uh, and if you have a calculator, better, better break out your calculator, because you're going to have to do this in about a minute. I have a clicker question coming up for you. Uh, what do you get for 45 times 0 0.8627? Anybody? Bueller? 38.8217, Anybody verify 38.0? Okay. Yeah, okay. We've got some verification around here. Yeah, that's what I got, 38.8. Uh, and hey, you guys, even 38.001, I would round up. Now, this one you would round up normally by normal round-off rules. But even 38.0001, I would round up to 39. So this goes down as 39 points. So 39 out of 45 for this student. All right. Now let me pause for questions. Something you want me to double check with you or re-verify? Raise your hand. Because you're going to do this on clickers in just a second. Okay, I want this to be numeric. No, wait a minute. This is this next one's multiple choice. Hands, questions. So, okay, question over here. Yeah, I'm going to ask you for the pointage. So you'll whatever you get, you know, at the very end, then round it up. Okay. And I do it all in my spreadsheet. You know, I have a formula. It's pretty easy. If you know if you know Excel or, or any kind of spreadsheet, it's pretty basic. Question in the back. Hold 
Hold, hold on a second. Can you repeat that? I, I can barely hear you. No, no. You, you calculate your percentage. That's your first step. And you can do that from the grades page. In this case, 11 out of 15. If that number is 0 0.85 or higher, you're done. Just write down 45 out of 45 for yourself. If, like this student, this imaginary student, if you... You with me? If you come in below 85%, you got to crank it through this proportion in the second equation block. And it's not that bodacious. You put the, your percentage in the top and then 85% in the bottom and then just grind it through. And it's not that bodacious. It's a, you know. Did you take notes? Good. Okay. Does that answer your question? Okay. Another question. Are you on the frequency back there in the back row with the black shirt? Mr. No Bass Man? Okay, good. All right, let's go to the next page. Let's, you guys can give it a try. Ready? And get your calculator out and you'll be done like this. Now, this is multiple choice. Hit the refresh key on your calculator. Go ahead and start it. Here's your hypothetical. You have 22 out of 28. Okay, slightly different, you know, a little bit further into the semester. 28 questions now, and you've got 22 of them answered. How many participation points out of 45 do you earn? All right, go ahead and start. And I can see you guys typing in numbers. And just do it like we just did. You know, 22 out of 28, that's your percentage. Is it below or above 85? This one's slightly below. So you have to do the proportion. You just do that. We'll just let this cook. How many people answered in the previous question? Do you recall? See how this spread is. See, that's the correct one. This one is tripping people up. See, in it, see how it's tempting. I can see a bunch of you guys were napping. All right, 30 seconds. You're doing, but most of you are doing good here. <coughs> 20 seconds. 15 seconds. <coughs> 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, let's switch over to. All right, now here's the display of the results. And option D is correct. So, and most of you got that, so I'm very happy about that. But now look at these guys down here voting for option D. Switch back to the laptop, please. That's 16% of you. That's the raw number, but you're supposed to round that up. So you were, if you answer D, you were napping. Okay? I always round up participation and homework points as well. When I, and I'll show you how I do homework points. It's even easier, way easier than this. Uh, but I round that up too. Even if you have, you know, like point... Uh, seven, 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 
Uh, no, even if you have, uh, you know, 20.001, I'll round that up to 21, you know, out of whatever. So here's your correct answer, okay? Do not let me catch you napping, all right? Now, uh, before we depart from this lovely topic, uh, do you have any more questions remaining? Yes. What's that? Uh, hold on. Hold on to your observations question. About the calculation. Okay, observation question. Go ahead. So it, it seems like most of the time they meet up at like Wednesday night. Is there a long night like called Wednesday night? Or would you be able to just go after if they usually meet up late? You show up late? Yeah. I think you can do it and if you're if you just tell them, you know, I just got here. Okay. Can I, you know, they'll they'll probably work with you. Cuz remember those guys, so I don't I don't think you can how was this? It was supposed to go 8 to 9.30 last night, right? Is that right? Okay. So if you show up at 9.25, maybe not. But if you show up at 9-ish, 9.010 or so, uh, you know, they'll probably give you a break. I would, because those guys are going to be there late, screwing around on the telescope and stuff. So. They might even Shanghai into the Astronomical Society. It is actually pretty fun. You know, because you're operating, a, that's a million dollar telescope up there. They, they, more than that. So it's a pretty nice piece. And if you think about it, those guys, when they graduate from UCF, they are going to have a job in about five minutes or even before they leave. Uh, so it's a good you know, free job training. All right, let's talk about Saturn. And I know that everybody was thrilled that went there last night, so I'm just going to cool you off with some boring data. But go ahead and jot down this website address, National uh, Space Science Data Center. Uh, they have this lovely planetary fact sheet for all the planets and Pluto, the dwarf planet. And also the moon is on there, our moon. Um, and uh, you can click on any of the planets. And you can see that I've clicked on a bunch of them uh, recently. And uh, so here's, uh, and if you didn't get it all jotted down, that's all right. You can check it from YouTube or just look for it, planetary fact sheet. Here's the Saturn fact sheet. And what... What they do is they give you the numbers like the mass, for instance, that's the top line here. Let me make this a little bit bigger for you. Um, 568.34 for Saturn. And then over there on the left, it says mass 10 to the 24 kilograms. So really they're kind of giving you a, a scientific notation style value for the mass in kilograms. And then they take the ratio mass to mass, uh, Saturn to Earth. And for, so what that tells you is that the mass of Saturn is about 95 times the mass of our planet. But the composition is way different. It's mostly hydrogen and helium out there in Saturn. Volume, same thing. Uh, that's in cubic kilometers equatorial radius at the one bar level. Now, I'll explain that towards the end of class, what that means. One bar, that means sea level, the equivalent of sea level. Polar radius, so equatorial radius is uh, measured around the equator. Polar radius is measured north pole to south pole and back to north pole. And they're not always different because as planets rotate, they flatten out a little bit. And Earth is a little bit flat as well. And so our polar radius is slightly different from our equatorial radius. And then the volumetric mean radius, that's basically solving for uh, R in the spherical 
formula for, uh, for uh, volume, which is four-thirds. If you want to jot down the formula for a sphere, four-thirds pi times r to the third power. Four-thirds pi r to the third. And so if they know the mass and the density and the volume, they can figure out a volumetric mean radius. And so they're all fairly close together. For, for Saturn, it's in the 50s and 60 for the equatorial. And you can see the, the polar radius is a little bit smaller than the equatorial radius. Uh, and same for Earth. Uh, the equatorial radius is 6378. Uh, the polar radius 6356 for Earth, so you can see Earth's flattened a little bit. Uh, Saturn's uh, flattened quite a bit. Um, and so you can see the flattening, the ellipticity uh, of, the, uh, of the two planets. It's, um, it's uh, quite a bit more for Saturn. Anyways, all kinds of data. Uh, here's kind of some cool uh, data about this, the atmosphere of Saturn. Uh, and let's take a close-up look at some of this. Um, surface pressure, temperature at one bar. Now, one bar, that means at the equivalent of sea level. Our um, uh, fair weather at sea level is one bar of, of atmospheric pressure, uh, which is, uh, let's see, 1,011, 1,013 millibars. If you listen to the Weather Channel, they always talk about, you know, hurricanes, central pressure is 905 millibars or something. They all, Weather Channel is always talking about millibars, but uh, other people talk about bars, atmospheres, stuff like that. Uh, wind speeds up to, four, look at that, 400 meters per second. That's like 900 miles an hour. Holy buckets. Those winds are really whipping. And, uh, and that's um, in the equatorial region below 30 degrees. So that's uh, negative 30 degrees south latitude up to 30 degrees uh, north latitude. So that's the tropical area, same as Florida. We're in, we're in that. We would be in that region. Scale height 59. Uh, atmospheric composition. Look at this. Molecular hydrogen, 96.3%. Uh, helium, uh, it's, off the, it's off the chart here. Uh, methane, these are parts per million. Methane CH4, 4,500 parts per million. And ammonia NH3 is 125 parts per million. Hydrogen deuteride, hydrogen deuteride, you know what that is? That's a molecule of hydrogen and deuterium bound together. That's a regular, iso uh, a regular hydrogen and an isotope, the deuterium isotope bound together. Just like in heavy water. You know, D2O is um, a deuterium and a hydrogen and an oxygen. And this is hydrogen deuteride. Uh, aerosols, that's in the upper atmosphere. Ammonia ice, water ice, ammonia hydrosulfide, Whoa, that must smell really bad. Um, and down here towards the bottom, you can see a lot of other uh, links, like the Saturnian satellite fact sheet, Saturnian rings. I don't know how many moons or satellites for Saturn there are. It's like 40-something. You know, every few years they discover a few really small ones. And the rings, you know, there's a lot of facts about the rings. We're going to talk about both of those things today. Anyway, so the, fat, the Saturn fact sheet. Now, the magnificent Cassini spacecraft is the next thing I want to mention. Now, this is a picture of one of our UCF physics department faculty, Dr. Josh Caldwell. And he's a good guy. He sometimes teaches, uh, like, intro physics 2053. 2048. I like everybody else in the department. Uh, sometimes he has this class, 2002, Intro Astronomy. And he is considered a world expert on the, the things that, sat, that Cassini was looking at uh, in the planet Saturn. Uh, so he is, 
the M-A-N when it comes to Cassini and Saturn. And he's a good guy. If you go up and talk to him, he'll talk to you. He's not, he's not one of these you know, guys that's too, you know, too, too much of a big shot to talk to us regular civilians. So anyways, Cassini was launched in 97, and they just plunged it through the atmosphere. The final suicide mission of Cassini, uh, just a couple weeks ago, September 15th, just about a month ago. Uh, they finally ran out of fuel and everything to uh, keep it positioned and stuff, so they, they got it on a few really close orbitals, passbys, for the past few months, um, and then one final one to take it directly into the atmosphere of Saturn. And Cassini was blazing back information all you know up until it was you know cut off. It was, and we got a lot of information on the uh, atmosphere of Saturn. You know what kind of uh, gases uh, and what the proportions were, the composition and stuff. But the main thing that Cassini did was measure with really, really accurate photos and imagery, infrared, visual, uh, of Saturn itself and its rings. That's taken from many thousands of miles away. Look at the detail. I'm going to ask you in a minute to type in uh, some fact that you see in a photo that's coming up, all right? And you're going to be able to type in whatever you want. But just look at the detail in this. Can you turn off these front lights? Make it even darker. All right. Let me ask you a visual IQ test here. Look at this. Which direction is the SUN? in this picture. It's over this way, because that's, yeah, right. It's the sunny side of Saturn. Look at the shadow. Look how sharp that shadow is. Look at the edge of that. Talk about definition. And this is like from, you know, many thousands, tens of thousands of miles away from Jupiter, from Saturn. Can you see anything in the, I can, can you see anything in the atmosphere? Can you see any details in the atmosphere? I mean, Cassini, let's take a look at this one. Oh, this one doesn't come through as nice, it'll come through nicely on, on YouTube. Uh, or if you actually go to the Cassini website. Um, but this one, you can see the atmosphere um, direction to the sun on this picture. Yep. I see a student over here. She doesn't want to show that she knows everything. She's just going like this with her hand. Uh, yeah, it's off, off to the left. And uh, did you know that the rings of Saturn, we can see the rings. Right now, what that means is, and we can see him, actually, we can really see him here, and we can see him a little bit more faintly here because of the angle that we're looking at it. But anything like this that you can see, it's, it's not a bunch of little light bulbs up there. It's reflected sunlight. All right. And so what you're looking at is really small little particles in a thin layer all the way up to big boulder size, we think. You know, the size of a truck and, and maybe a little bit bigger than that. Uh, all in a ring formation. And did you know that, you, that the rings of Saturn can illuminate uh, different moons of Saturn? Because the rings reflect light from the sun. And if there's a moon 
that is nearby the rings or at just the right angle, it'll catch a little bit of sunlight bounced off the, the rings and up to the moon, and you can see that moon, you know, or, or any other, you know, any other object that's out there. Here's another picture. Look at this one. This one's, uh, go ahead and make a note. This is from chapter 11, 11.1. .1. This is figure three. This is a Cassini photo. You see that little arrow down there? You know what that is? It's a moon of Saturn, right? No, that's us. That's the Earth. Cassini can see all the way back to Earth. Look at that. That's Earth down there where that arrow is. Man. And there's the rings up there. And you can also see, if you look, look along the circular edge of Saturn, you can see, see how you've got kind of like that bright line there? That is a sign of an atmosphere. Just like Earth, when we, you know, go up to, in the space shuttle or, well, I'm sure nobody here has been up in the space. Nobody here has been up in the space shuttle, right? You better not be because I'd be severely jealous. But anyways, it, people that are up in the space shuttle or they send photos back down to Earth, uh, you can see the atmosphere, the little bluish atmosphere of Earth. Now, let's take a look at some of the moons. This is one of the big ones. Go ahead and write down that word, Enceladus. And what do you notice about Enceladus? Is that, what do you notice? It looks kind of icy. It's pretty, yeah, it's pretty light colored, like water ice. What else do you notice? Those, those stripy, yeah, what is that? I don't know what it is, but, and I don't even know if Dr. Colwell knows what those are, but I'm sure people are studying them like, you know what? Studying them like crazy. What else do you notice? What do you notice? There's craters on there. Now, let me ask you a question. Mental IQ test question here. Does this look as cratered as our moon? No, I see everybody going, no, Dr. B, no, not at all. And go ahead and make a note of that. Enceladus has craters. Okay. But it's not nearly as blown up as the moon. Now, why is that? Question, yeah. Remark. Is it, is it because the side with the craters is facing away from Saturn? Yeah, good question. Is the side without the craters facing towards Saturn? Answer, no, this thing spins. It's Enceladus. It does have a spin, so it's not always facing in towards Saturn. The way ours, ours is, you know, we always have the same side facing Earth. Uh, in the back with the blue shirt. It's active, yeah, it acts, it's, it's on an orbit, yeah, it's active. The moon is active? You mean our moon? Enceladus? You have to say the word. Say it. No, say the word. Enceladus. Right. Good. So you're saying that Enceladus is active? In what way? In the NFL? Active in sororities and fraternities? Or what? What are you, what are you getting at here? Oh, you, you know that that's ice? Well, you, so you're saying that its, it's surface obliterates old craters if they're old enough. And so, so what you're implying, is this, do you guys agree with the logic here? That these craters, if, if you're, what, what's your name? Blue shirt. 
Kirsten? If, if Kirsten is right, then these craters that we see, they're either really old or really young. Which is it? Young, relatively young. If the surface really is ice, uh, here's another question related to, to our planet. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever seen a crater on this planet. A few of you. What, in books? In, yeah, in astronomy books? Yeah. There's a famous one in Arizona called Meteor Crater. Uh, and believe it or not, we have seen impact craters on Earth, but they're very hard to see. Uh, but recent ones we can find by looking at the geological formations sometimes, uh, and sometimes little ridges and, and even just the composition of the rocks in a certain area. Uh, but, Kirsten, the earth has erosion of the surface. So go ahead and make a note of that. Earth has erosion. Water Wind, weather in general, dump trucks, you know, humans. We don't do that much, but over the eons, all the, you know, the earth has taken as many hits as the moon. But the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, and we do, and therefore we have weather, we have rain, we have snow, we have wind, and all that stuff erodes the surface of the earth the way that you were trying to express for Enceladus, and the answer is, yes, there is a process on Enceladus, we think. And yes, it is an icy planet. Uh, and it doesn't have much of an atmosphere, but it does have other erosion. Uh, and I, and um, who's, who noticed that about the stripes? Uh, anyways, those stripes that you see um, are related to that. In fact, you see anything else on there that we haven't really mentioned? We talked about craters. We talked about those bluish stripes. That it looks icy. What else do you notice? Yeah, in the back. Yeah, it looks like ripples, and I see some ripples in the in the upper right as, or the upper left as well. If you look carefully, and when you guys look at it on YouTube or go to the Cassini website and look at Enceladus, you'll see that there's, there's ridges, valleys. It looks like wrinkles. You know? And what is that from? Kirsten, that's from erosion, we think. You know, the surface is bending and fracturing and blooping and blapping. Now... Compared to Florida, this is the size of Enceladus. It's not that big. Well, it's big compared to Florida. It's basically Jacksonville to Miami. All right, so go ahead and make a, a sketch of Florida. And a sketch of, this is Enceladus centered on Orlando. About 250 kilometers. So basically Miami to Jacksonville. And that's the relative size of it. Now, I want to, I don't know if this is going to work. Let's see if this, I've embedded an animated GIF in my slides today. Let's see if this works. All right. Now, you see this little, I want you to watch right down here at, towards the bottom of this image. If you look at it carefully, you'll see just a little blip of white down there. Now let me see if I can get this to animate. There we go. Now look at it. Here it comes. See it? You know what that is? That's geysers of water. H2O. And see those little flashes in the background? You know what that is? Look at them. All the little flashes. See those? 
stars. You know, taking a photo of Enceladus, blazing out these geysers, you catch a few stars in the background. Star trails. So Kirsten, yeah, that's definitely erosionary. And uh, over here, you, you notice the ripples and stuff. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm sure that those, matter of fact, this is kind of what we think um, is the structure. Down in the South Pole, there's active jets geysering uh, out water. And we think that there's an icy crust, a rocky core, and then a liquid ocean underneath the water or underneath the icy crust. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. If there's all that water, do you think we, want, we might want to use some of that water at some point, drill a little hole down there, and extract some of that H2O so we can live somewhere near Enceladus? You know, like one of the outer moons or something? You know, a mining, a mining colony on one of the moons of Saturn. And this is their water reservoir. Just like here, we have reservoirs. You know, we use the Floridan aquifer for most of our water here in Florida. Okay, there's your aquifer if you're on a Saturn colony. Saturn 9, the colony on moon number 9 of Saturn. Question? It's, well, it's a good question, and I'm sure people are trying to figure it out from looking at those plumes. They know that that's mostly water. And they think it's a rocky core, so that means a lot of silicates, maybe some iron and stuff in there. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely uh, ongoing research. So if anybody is, I'll tell you what, you know, I know some of you are interested in, in doing undergraduate research. And if you want to learn more and research about what's happening in Saturn and stuff, Dr. Colwell's the one to talk to. And just ask me and I'll, I'll give you an introduction. Now, I want to go back to this idea of Florida and Enceladus. Um, Enceladus is one of the, it's not the biggest moon for Saturn. It's fairly medium sized. If you took Enceladus and put it down on the city of Avon Park, it would, okay, now instead of centered on our land, now we shifted it a little bit to Avon, Avon Park, you know, the, the center of the Florida aquifer. Uh, so 500 kilo, kilometer diameter, 250 kilometer radius. Um, that's the relative size of it. Now, let me park that up here to the side. Now, here's, here's uh, Avon Park down here where this little letter A is, okay? Enceladus is not that big as the Jovian moons go. As, and the word Jovian means um, the jo related to the Jovian planets. The Jovian planets are Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, or uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, the outer four planets. Uh, so the adjective for those is Jovian. Um, now, the reason I'm bringing that up to you is what would happen if something as big as Enceladus crashed into our planet, right? You know, you know, like in a, uh, you know, like in some movie with Bruce Willis or Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, they got to rescue the, the entire world and stuff like that. Well, go ahead and take some notes on, on uh, Chicxulub. That's the big impact that we definitely know happened down in the Yucatan Peninsula. All right, now that's fairly close to Florida, just down the way. You fly there in a few hours from Orlando. The crater there is about 180 kilometers in diameter. And we think that the object that hit in Chicxulub that exterminated the dinosaurs, they say, uh, was about 10 kilometers in diameter. Now, normally speaking, here's a close-up of it. This is a, a, um, along the coast. This kind of white line here is the coast of Yucatan, and then out here is, is actually the Gulf of Mexico, 
over here up, up towards the upper part. And you can see pictures of Chicxulub all over the place. But this one shows the, um, uh, some of the geological formations um, in that uh, area. Now, the general rule uh, for craters formed by some kind of an impactor, whether it's a comet or an asteroid, usually 10 to 1. So the crater is usually 10 times bigger than the object that hits it. All right? So, for instance, if you have a 10-kilometer object that hits somewhere, it's going to make, a, you know, in general terms, a 100-kilometer wide um, impact crater. And, hey, you guys, we see impact crater. There's, there's a huge one, believe it or not, um, in Chesapeake Bay, up between Maryland and uh, Delaware and Virginia, it's, it's part of it's in the bay itself, a part of it's up on the Delmarva Peninsula, if I remember correctly, over there by Shinkle Teague Island and all that stuff. Um, huge impact crater, subterranean er, uh, submarine crater, most of it, but we can see the remnants of it. We can see the remnants of Chicxulub. We can, there's a famous, famous, famous one over in Holland. The guy who figured out this uh, found, a, found a gigantic impact crater in Holland because he was looking at a church that was made of rock that was formed in the impact zillions of years ago, whenever it was, and formed rock formations that they later quarried and made a church, probably a bunch of other buildings. And so he's looking at this church, very famous guy, and um, he said, you know, this looks like impact glass or impact uh, uh, minerals that only form with hydrogen bombs it, it tested in the atmosphere uh, and with huge impacts of meteorites, meteors. So he's thinking, this church... Yeah, he's just sightseeing. This, this stuff looks like impact glass. Where the, And so he looked around and he found this ring-shaped geological formation that nobody ever twigged to before that. And now we're finding them everywhere. There's a gigantic one up in uh, Quebec. It, for, it actually forms a ring-shaped reservoir up there for their hydroelectric projects. Unbelievable. But they're everywhere if you have eyes to see them, but they're not as easy to see as the moon and not even as easy as Enceladus. But so here's a question for you. Uh, what would Enceladus impact extinguish if it hit, you know, like at Avon Park? All right, so 10 to 1. 250 kilometer radius of the object. So 2,500 kilometer radius for the crater. Let's take a look. All right, so here's your impact. Avon Park. There's your, there's your 2,500 kilometer. Take a look at that. Go ahead and make a sketch of North America. And then t put in that circle. Kind of eyeball it in. Nova Scotia all the way down to Panama. And that, my wonderful students, tells you that we have not had an impact by anything remotely the size of Enceladus because that would definitely leave a mark. That would be a mega crater on our... I mean, it would probably destroy the planet is what it would do. And it would definitely extinguish us. And everybody from... And that's not even the atmospheric effects. I mean, all that, all that debris blown up into the, into the atmosphere, you know, just like a, a, a volcano. You know, the, these big volcanoes, they spew all this dust and ash into the atmosphere, and it changes the temperature of the, you know, globally uh, of the Earth by, you know, a degree or two cooler for years. 
Uh, so this one would just, you know, be total destruction, basically. Uh, what would it extinguish? Uh, pretty much everything. So, uh, so it's very bad news. Now, hopefully we we'll, won't have to worry about that because Bruce Willis is retired now. He can't see him. Arnold's retired, you know. I don't think they're going to come out of retirement to save the world. Let's take a look. Now, this is where I want you to look really carefully. Here's the last image of Cassini. Now, this is the black and white version. We're going to look at this one and, and closely in a few minutes. Here's the color one. The same, same image, but this is the, from the, uh, the color photo. All right, so... This is the last one it got out before it lost contact. All right. Now I want you to look carefully at the details. And I'm going to ask you a clicker question in a minute to tell me, to tell, to asking you to type in a word or a short phrase uh, to describe something that you notice in this grayscale image. All right. So look at it carefully. Don't, don't raise your hand. You're going to click it in. Okay. Okay. So this is going to be a short answer. You're going to, so hit the refresh key on your calculator. Go ahead and start it. Here's your question. And I'll go back to the picture here in a second. Uh, type in a word or a short phrase that you notice. So hit the refresh key if you have to, and then start typing in. Now, everybody's going to get every answer except IDK or French fry, you know, but every normal answer is going to get mar be marked correct. Ooh. Ooh, a misspelling. What is this? You have to do it in English. Because I don't, I don't know how to read Spanish. Yeah, you can mark all these correct. Let's go down and... Try to, sp well, I'm not going to, I've never, I've never, some of these words, I've never seen them spelled that way. That's all right. I get it. You know, this is interesting to see what you guys are typing in here. Just wait until you close it, but go back and you know, mark every single one of them right. This is real. Somebody's goofing around with me. Don't just type in the letter A. Just try, try to type something in. This is really interesting. I'm going to make a discussion posting about this. This, this is so, so excellent. You know, a multiple choice question, I, give, I basically control your minds. I tell you what, what the question is, I tell you what the answers are, and you have to find out which one. But this, you have to type in your own answer. And a lot of them look really good, and inter except for some of these mis... Here's another misspelling. <laughs> oh, it's all right. What? Oh, I'm going to ask about that. I'm going to ask about that one. All right, one minute. Oh, I am so glad I asked you guys this question. I just wish the screen was a little bit better resolution.
you know that some of these are really important. 30 seconds. Yeah, this is, you know, this is interesting to see what students are. <laughs> this is three misspellings of one word. That's pretty good. 10, 9, 8, 7. Hit the send key if you haven't already. 6, 5. Four, three, two, one, zero. All right. Yeah, let's look at this. Go to the top and go to go to the uh, computer display. All right. Yeah, I don't know about that. And here's two of the misspellings. Can you bring atmosphere misspelled? Anyways, I'll give you that. But um, atmosphere is, is good. That's a good. That's a good perception. Black and gray. That's colors. Blotches. Blurry horizon. Bumps. See now, bumps. <coughs> That you hold it there, bumps, bumps or mountains. Don't laugh, don't laugh. I'm not laughing. That's cool. I, I like that because you know if you were looking at atmospheric storms and you you know on our planet from space and you didn't know, you know, you didn't come from, you know, you came from the moon and there's no weather on the moon, so you don't know what weather is. You might think of them as bumps. Keep going. Let's look at some more. Clouds, clouds, cloud. How did that? Oh, it's got an underscore. Clouds density, clouds are storms. Keep going. Crater. Where's the craters? That's what I want to know. Keep going. Dark, darkness. See, the colors, um, dark side, what? I don't see any Darth Vader up there. Go move it up a little bit. Go back up to darkness and dark color. Okay, good. Um, the color, see, you know, what you guys are doing, you're, you're doing what scientists do. You're analyzing. And almost every one of these things that you guys have typed in is righteous, except for uh, the dark side. That's some, but every in every lab there's some goofball. It's always, it's all right. Debris dense. Let's keep going down here. Dots dust by surface. Now dust or atmosphere. Uh, I don't know how you see dust in that picture, but okay. Go ahead, keep going. Erosion, exposed to sun. Yeah, exposed to sun, fading, foggy, fragment, frost. Whoa, hold on. Gas plus waves. Switch back to the... Yeah, okay. I guess you could see waves in there. And see, do you, you ever hear... On Weather Channel or, or, or the, the local news weather, a tropical wave is coming in from Africa. Waves, yeah. So you're looking at the upper atmosphere of Saturn there. And so, yeah, waves in the atmosphere, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a thing. Keep going. Ice, I don't know. Nah, that's no good. That's cute the first time, but after that it's... Light streaks, many objects. Uh, moon, hold it with there. Uh, I take it by, oh, they can't see this. Go ahead. Um, wait a minute. Somebody typed in the word moon. I take it that you meant that little dot up there. See, right there, one person typed in moon. Mountain, mountain ranges. 
See, now, hold it there, mountain ranges. Remember how I was telling you guys, did I tell you about the Italian word for what they saw on the surface of Mars? The canal? Yeah. The reason that there was all this controversy about little green men on Mars is because an Italian astronomer named Schiaparelli observed these linear structures that we now know is this big, huge canyon. Uh, and he observed them with a telescope and he thought they looked like channels. And so the Italian word for that is canali, C-A-N-A or C-A-N-N-A-L-I. And somebody mistranslated it as channel, as canals, so the, into English. And so, in, so then in the English speaking world, oh my God, the Martians have built canals in, in the surface of Mars. You know, they have boats and, you know, like the Erie Canal. You know, so now this one's similar. This person's looking at an atmosphere that is not solid, but they see mountains and mountain ranges. So it's, it's, uh, it's good. I'm glad. Let's keep going. Let's look at some more of these. Oceans of gases, particles, pockets. Keep going. Rays. Ooh, reflective spot. Rock formations, shade, shadow, silver, specks, specks of dust, spots and light, stars. What are SPQTs? Spots, I guess. Uh, Stree one ipes. Uh, texture, very dense. Water. Hold on, hold on. Go back up there. Waves. There's another waves. A couple people voted for waves. And waves is a thing in any atmosphere. Uh, white dots, white flares, white lines, white specks, white spots, white dot, wind streaks. Uh, okay, switch back to regular. So all these things that you guys have mentioned are uh, righteous. Almost all of them, I should say, except for aliens and dark side and stuff, but you know, the goofy answers. Uh, yeah, mark them all correct. And we're given... Trisha's grading this now, so everybody, see if you can type, uh, click on the, the word. Good, that's easier. Um, all right, let's keep going. Let's, let's talk about some specs. Now I'm going to talk about all the outer planets. Uh, we'll talk about this for a few minutes and then dismiss. You know, we just did crowdsourcing. We should do more of this. Because it's possible that somebody in here will see something that no one else on the planet. This is a big enough class. This is 300 students. You could be my research, Dr. Colwell's research assistants. Looking at all these images. I do research for Colwell. Do you? Mm -hmm. Trisha does research for Colwell. That's why she's here. I knew there was something I liked about you. A lot of things. Okay, so as I mentioned last time, uh, the core is considered to be rock and metal. Some hydrogen compounds, and they think it's about the size for most of the outer planets. About the same size as Earth now. Down here, this little pie-shaped baby down here, that's Earth compared to a Jupiter. And you can see up here the cloud tops. That's what we actually see. And then below that is the gaseous hydrogen and then liquid hydrogen. And then we think that hydrogen is so compressed. There's so much pressure, so much weight of the stuff above it, excuse me, that it compresses into metallic form. And then below that... Are the, um, are the core uh, layers. So the outer layer is metallic, liquid, and then gaseous. Hydrogen and helium, and then the outer cloud layers. The outer cloud layers are going to be stuff like ammonia, um, CO2, water. Uh, and we have water clouds on our, on our planet. That's the only thing we have. Now, if you compare Saturn to Jupiter, 
you have to go a lot deeper into Saturn before you hit the metallic hydrogen, we think. And we're not sure about it 100%, but that's what we think. So here's a sketch, you know, uh, where we compare the, the purpley metallic hydrogen layer, which is a big fraction of Jupiter, uh, to the same layer in Saturn. So here's a, here's a sketch, and just look at these two over here on the left. Uh, here's Jupiter, and look how deep down, relatively speaking, you have to dip before you get into the purple metallic hydrogen layer in this model. Um, and another way to say it is, why are Jupiter's dense layers, metallic hydrogen, so close to the surface of Jupiter. You know, you have to, you have to dip at least 50%, maybe more, uh, into uh, Saturn to get down to that metallic hydrogen. Why is that? Well, one of the things about hydrogen gas and helium gas and so forth is they're gases, they're compressible. And here's um, a favorite analogy that astronomers uh, like to, um, to talk about, the pillows analogy. If you have a lot of pillows, you keep stacking pillows, the one at the bottom is going to start getting really, um, let me move my, this one down here at the bottom, every pillow you add to the top, that one at the bottom is going to get squished down. And then the intermediate layers are going to be squished down more than the top layer. All right, so the more so what that means is the more kilograms of mass you have, which Jupiter has, it's like having a taller stack of pillows. But the pillows, if you have a big tall stack, it's going to eventually compress. So Jupiter, even though it has a lot more mass than Saturn, is actually um, just a little bit bigger in diameter. Let me repeat that. Jupiter because it has so much more mass, is just a little bit bigger than Saturn because of this pillow's analogy. So the more kilograms of mass you have, the more compression you get. And you may say to yourself, well, Dr. B, that's pretty boring uh, compression. I should do another clicker question right now. I'll have to remember to do that. Uh, the more kilo mass is the is the key of everything in astronomy. Mass is the DNA of stars. The more mass you have, the more compression you have at the core. The more compression you have at the core, in a planet, it doesn't really amount to much. It, it just means you have a dense core. But in a star, it'll be so dense and hot that it'll start nuclear fusion reactions, and that's when you have a star. As soon as it's so dense and hot that it'll sustain hydrogen fusion reactions. Now, let's talk about those pressures, atmospheric pressures, and we're almost done. And this is where I told you I'd tell you about um, bars and stuff like that. On Earth, fair weather at sea level is considered 1.01325 bars. Uh, as in barometric pressure, bar. Uh, that's the same as 1,013.25 millibars. Let's move the decimal point. Now, on the Weather Channel, they talk about that. Um, scientists that are trying to uh, make metallic hydrogen or, or you know, compressed gases, they talk about bars and atmospheres usually. Now, Jupiter has one bar of pressure way, way out in its outer layers, its outer cloud layers. All right, so that's up here. Uh, so here's the pressure in this diagram. Out here, you have one... But look at the pressure as you go down. This is 2 million bars of pressure. That would be crushing, pre you know, even the deepest part of the ocean doesn't have that much pressure. 2 million bars. 
And so hydrogen liquefies uh, at about 2,000 Kelvin on the Kelvin. I'm going to have to tell you about the Kelvin scale next time. Um, at about 500,000 bars, that's the proper combination of temperature and pressure to uh, liquefy. And we can liquefy hydrogen here on Earth. It's hard for us to, to make, to solidify hydrogen, metallic hydrogen. So the cloud layers are out there in the low pressure area. Um, and supposedly the reddish brown stuff that you see in Jupiter and Saturn is ammonium hydrosulfide, NH4SH. So uh, it's basically uh, hydrogen sulfide bound to ammonium. Uh, both hydrogen sulfide and ammonia both smell bad. They're volatile. Um, so um, the whitish layers we think in are, are uh, water and ammonia uh, clouds, uh, liquefied, you know, liquefied droplets. That's what a cloud is. It's uh, micro droplets of liquid water on Earth, on uh, Jupiter, ammonium, water, and ammonium hydrosulfide, we think. And you get all those kind of reddish brown layers. You know, the great red spot on Jupiter, that's what we think it's, it's made of. All right, it's 1020. Let's dismiss. I'll set up a reading assignment and some questions. They'll be due at 9 a.m. on Tuesday. You're dismissed. Look for the reading assignment uh, by lunchtime tomorrow. Come up to the front if you want to get your exam printout and you haven't already gotten it.